Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Chris Soria. I'm a current uh, demography PhD student, and I'll be introducing today's speaker. So Liz uh, Garrett is professor of sociology and public affairs at Princeton. Her research lies at the intersection of migration, economic sociology, and inequality. Uh, within this general area, she studies the mechanisms that enable or constrain mobility and lead to greater or lesser degrees of social and economic inequality. Her work has been published in journals such as American Journal of Sociology, Demography, Population and Development Review, Sociological Methods and Research. Her book, On the Move, Changing Mechanisms of Mexico-U.S. Migration, has won three Best Book Awards. And with that, I'll pass it on to you, Phyllis. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for having me. Um, so today I'm going to talk about this recent line of work, which is um, on how environmental factors shape human migration. And we are a large team, relatively large team working on this question. And we got two grants that brought our uh, team together. So right now we have two economists and environmental scientists and two students who've now become postdocs or faculty. Um, at different places. And I'm going to basically weave together a number of papers, and each of these papers um, has a combination of us on it. So we're studying the Mexico-US migration case, uh, the largest sustained international flow in the world. Uh, if we look at the numbers, in 1980, there were about 2 million Mexican born in the United States, as shown in the solid line. By 2010, the number had reached 12 million, and about half of these migrants were undocumented. So what brings these migrants to the United States? The historical beginnings actually go back to 1900s, and this is when the rail lines start to connect central western states in Mexico to the Texas border, and employers use these rail lines to recruit Mexican workers. And by 1942, employers actually no longer had to make this trip. Uh, World War II created significant labor shortages in the U.S., and to make up for that, uh, we signed a labor agreement with Mexico, the so-called Bracera program, and in the following 20 years, about 5 million workers came here on temporary work visas. So these early migrants actually form the foundation for migrant networks that persist to present day, and these networks connect migrants in the United States to family and community members back home. They transmit information, norms, and we believe that they make uh, migration a path-dependent process. Of course, migration still continues to make sense because of the economic differences between the two countries. So the latest research shows uh, that workers in, the, in Mexico can at least double their wages by just crossing the border. Um, and uh, this applies at, you know, at all skill levels. Now, here we're asking a slightly different question. In addition to what we know about Mexican migration, the historical roots, the social factors underlying it, the economic differentials, what about environmental drivers? Have they been historically a factor? And research to date focuses mainly on weather fluctuations. So these are gradual changes in rain, uh, rainfall and temperature. There is also some emergent work uh, emergent work looking at uh, sudden onset events like hurricanes, but we're not focusing on that here. So some of the findings emerging from this literature are actually quite consistent and reasonable. So for example, in 2003, one, in one of the first studies, Munshi, um, who was an economist, he showed that low rainfall in Mexico was associated with more US migration. And the proposed mechanism was agricultural yields. Later work uh, tested this mechanism specifically and showed that low rainfall in Mexico leads to low crop yields, and that brings more U.S. migration. Now, some of the recent findings, though, have become somewhat puzzling and mixed. I'll just give one example. Riasmana and colleagues report two conflicting findings using Mexican census data. First, they find that low rainfall, deficits of rainfall increase US migration, but this only seems to hold in well-off communities. So you might think that well-resourced communities are able to afford the cost of sending migrants, but the, the, the pattern is actually reversed when you look at extreme temperatures. We see that higher than average temperatures bring more US migration, but this only happens in poor communities. So this is just one example. 
Uh, here we have two weather stressors. One is creating a migration response in vulnerable communities. The other is uh, creating a response in well-resourced communities. And it shows us that, you know, it points to a more general issue that we're accumulating a lot of results, but we're not quite making sense of um, um, making sense of them or accumulating knowledge. So to get more credible and consistent results, which is our goal here, we need to address several issues. First of all, the data issue. We need highly granular data on both migration choices and weather patterns. Then we need to think about how to measure weather. We need to pick the right measures from an almost infinite set of choices. And we need to think carefully about the mechanisms underlying any observed weather effects, especially if we want to design policy interventions. And then we also need to consider temporal dynamics, potential intensification or decaying of effects. So I'll give a few examples. Imagine a drought that might initially have little impact on a community because there's an irrigation system um, or there's a well. But then if this drought persists over many years, then the community would eventually run out of these safety nets and will feel the effects of the drought. This is what we would call intensification of effects. We can also imagine the opposite scenario, a drought that creates an initial response that eventually dies down because the community has adapted. For example, they've divested from agriculture eventually, or they're no longer impacted by, uh, by weather. So we need to kind of take into account these potential uh, pathways. We also need to, as sociologists, think about heterogeneity in effects, how weather impacts different groups of people, why do they respond differently, if so. And then finally, weather is not the only uh, big factor here. We need to think about other major changes in the context, like change in trade or migration policies. So a tall order. And I'm going to talk about how we try to address each of these issues and what we find. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the data. The migration data come from the Mexican Migration Project, or the MMP. So MMP currently covers around 140,000 individuals residing in 170 communities in Mexico. And in this sample, about 20,000 have migrated to the US at least once. So the way the data that were collected was kind of like a repeated cross section. So the team surveyed each community once, sometime between 1982 and 2018. And each community, the team randomly selected 200 households and got detailed retrospective life info, uh, history information on each individual, including absent migrants. So we use this retrospective information to create a pseudo panel data set. So we follow the characteristics and migration choices of individuals annually from 1990 on, uh, onwards. So this gives us about 1 million person year observations to work with. Now we combine the data, the survey data from the MMP with gridded weather data from DayMet, which is a service provided by NASA. So these data cover every kilometer square grid on Earth, and they provide daily measurements of temperature and precipitation for each of these grids from 1980 onwards. Now, we merge these two data sources. So we take the spatial boundary of each of these MMP communities, and then first average weather measures across these grids in that boundary. So this gives us daily precipitation and temperature measures for each community. And then we aggregate these daily values to create more seasonal or annual measures. Now, why is this important? We spent a lot of time basically putting this data together. Many studies actually report findings based on weather measured at much lower resolution, for example, at the state level in Mexico. But we find that these findings can be actually misleading. So let's take one weather measure to show kind of the implications of this. So here, um, the map is showing the number of days over 30 degrees Celsius. So these are basically very hot days that are harmful uh, for crop growth. So in this map, we're comparing the number of hot days in each state in year 2000 to the average number of annual hot days between 1980 and 1984. And we're showing the difference between two, the two. So basically, we're treating 80, 1980 to 84 as the baseline period. We're trying to understand how far off the community was in terms of its um, the temperature experience in year 2000. And we're showing the difference in standard deviations here. So the shades of orange on the map indicate that the state was hotter than its average in the past. And shades of blue 
show that it was cooler than average. And we see that most states were slightly hotter than normal, but not you know, massive differences. Now, when we increase the degree of granularity here, and we create the same map with municipality level data, we see a lot more variation. So if we look at the region marked by the red rectangle, we see that some municipalities actually experienced extreme heat, which was hidden in the state level averages. So these are municipalities much larger than the MMP communities that we're observing. So we're really trying to capture the microclimates, regional climates in, in the areas that we're studying and using a lot more granular data. Now, here I'm showing you one weather measure, but there are hundreds of other measures. The big question is, how do we go about choosing the right ones for understanding human mobility? Now, we try a couple of approaches here. And the first one is a data-driven approach. So here we use supervised machine learning or SML to pick the most predictive measures. So this method, supervised machine learning, involves pitting complex functions to link our weather measures or weather inputs to our outcome of migration. So our method of choice here is based on the so-called regression trees. So this is actually a really simple idea. It relies on a tree-like model that describes a sequence of splits in the input space X that predict an outcome Y at the end node. So let me give an example. We choose this because this kind of model is really good at capturing nonlinearities and interactions in X. Okay, so let's say kind of we wanna predict whether someone migrates in a given year, it's a zero one outcome, and we wanna predict it using two inputs or two uh, variables, age and education. So a regression tree might first split into two branches by age, young and old, and then each branch can then split into different levels of education. So college educated and not, not college educated. And then at the end of each of these uh, branches or what we call the leaf, we have a migration prediction. So here our migration prediction is one for young college graduates. So you can imagine that with enough splits in the tree, you can actually perfectly predict each observation in the sample. But then that would be overfitting the data and there are measures that you need to undertake to prevent that from happening. So I'll talk about that in a minute. So we use a version of this idea that relies on not just a single tree, but thousands of trees and we average the results over that. So this method is called random forests because it involves many, many trees. So this is done to yield more accurate predictions, but then in the end, you have less interpretable relationships between X and Y. Okay, so the output that we're looking at is whether someone takes a first migration trip to the US in a given year, and it's either zero or one. And our inputs include individual attributes like age, sex, education, household characteristics like business or property ownership, prior migration experience, community characteristics like share of people working in agriculture, share with prior US experience. And then our key attributes are related to weather. So different measures of temperature and precipitation. And we typically measure these in deviation form. So deviation from the norm, deviation from the baseline, because we wanna compare each community to its own self. We don't want to compare really hot areas to really cool areas. We just want to see change over time, whether a community is getting cooler or hotter and how that matters. So we basically reviewed the literature here and we took every indicator that we could find. And this gave us 30 plus indicators, everything um, from like very simple indicators to more sophisticated ones. And then we uh, we aggregated them uh, over by year and also by season. So plant to harvest season for corn, which is the most popular crop in these communities. We also wanted to capture temporal dynamics. So we included five lags for each indicator. It's going from T minus four, basically five years ago to this year, T. Now, a little bit into the weeds here, uh, a few decisions that we needed to make. So weather indicators become available after year 1980. We set aside 1980 to 1984 period as our baseline. And we use the average weather in this period to compute deviations in later years. This means that our data analysis can actually start in 1985, the earliest. 
But that's not exactly right. Remember I said that we include five-year lags for each weather indicator? So this means that we need to reserve 1985 to 1989 period for computing these lags. And then our data really begins in 1989. So our analysis period then is 1989 to 2016. Now, a little bit more on the methodology. So random forests are very complex models. The problem is um, they can capture both the signal and the noise in the data. In other words, they can overfit the data if we let them. So to prevent that and to make sure that our model would generalize to new data, we actually split our sample, which is a common practice in machine learning. After all the time restrictions, we end up with 54,000 individuals in our data. So remember that each individual is observed in multiple years. So we have multiple rows for the same person, and these observations are not independent, but the model does not really know that. Um, so to get around this issue, we convert our data into a wide format. So we basically take each individual, keep one observation for that individual, and then we code the history of weather in, in, in columns. So for migrants, we keep them on the year prior, on the year of their first US trip. For non-migrants, we pick a random year in the study period. Now, how we split our data. So three fourths of our observations of 54,000 individuals are used for training and validating our models. So basically the way it works is in this 40,000 um, individual sample, we fit a given model to 80% of the data at the time, and then evaluate the predictive performance in the remaining 20%. And then we cycle through the data, selecting a different 80% of the data at each time, and then we select the model that performs the best on average. We then have a reserved data set that we've kept in the vault, and this will tell us the true performance of our model on a data set that it hasn't yet seen. And for that, we've set aside a fourth uh, of our total sample size or 14,000 observations. So what I'm gonna present next comes from test data. So, the first question we wanted to ask is, can we really predict who the migrants are in our data? Now, if you know about the Fragile Families Challenge, there was a mass collaboration effort at Princeton where hundreds of teams competed on a task of predicting life outcomes. And they used similar models to this here, uh, sophisticated machine learning algorithms. And the results show that it was actually really hard to predict individual outcomes and simple regressions most of the time perform just as well as more sophisticated models. So our results are not that different um, in spirit. But let me first tell you kind of how well we do. So this figure is uh, a way to look at performance of different models. And on the y-axis, you have the true positive rate. So um, this is actual migrants in the data that our model identified as migrants, so correctly labeled as migrants. Now on the x-axis, we have the false positive rate. So these are actual non-migrants, people who never migrated, but for some reason our model thought they were migrants, so made a mistake. Now the different points on each of these curves show the trade-off between the true positive rate and the false positive rate as we shift the discrimination threshold between the two groups, migrants and non-migrants. Now, how does this help us? We can plot this curve for each of these models and then compute the area under the curve or the AUC. So this gives us a measure of model performance. So a perfect model, if we had a perfect model that can perfectly separate migrants from non-migrants, AUC would be one. In other words, our curve would just jump to one and then stay there. So the closer to AUC is to one, the better, more predictive is our model. So how did we do? So the solid line here is our best model with only individual level indicators. So age, sex, education, and some household characteristics. The area under the curve is already 0.79. This means that the model can correctly separate migrants from non-migrants 79% of the time. So what happens when we introduce the weather indicators? We get the long dashed curve here where the green arrow is pointing to. Now the AUC 
our performance metric is slightly higher. It's 0.81, meaning that we can now correctly classify 81% of the cases, a slight improvement. Now, what happens if we use just a simple uh, logistic regression model, for example, with a, with a few indicators? We actually get an AUC of 0.79. So although kind of this machine learning tools are improving predictions a little bit, they're not creating a huge margin in our predictions. And part of the reason for that is individual level indicators, which we include in the logistic regression, are already accounting for a lot of the variation in the data. But part of the reason why we still find this method helpful is because it can help us select among many different weather measures, which is not something that we could have done with a simple OLS. Now, how do we kind of fare there? So again, the goal here is using these tools, using prediction as a metric to selecting the weather measures uh, that are most relevant for migration behavior. So we have about 200 plus possibilities. So about 40 weather indicators that we included in the model, measured each measured over five time lags. So here's what we find. This figure shows the predictive power of our indicators on the test data. So this is the part of the data that our model has not seen. So how do we get the values here? First, we calculate the area under the curve for our model on the test data, which I showed. Then we take an indicator, say age, and shuffle its values. So we basically corrupt our data. And then we calculate um, the AUC, the resulting AUC, and we repeat this many, many times, average over these trials. And then we see how much the AUC has dropped when we've changed this or corrupted this one variable. So the higher the number here, the more important the variable is. Here, uh, the top row here shows what happens when we, for example, permute someone's gender. It leads to a 7% decrease in our predictive performance. So basically, gender is the most important factor in predicting who the migrants will be. Uh, same, the, the next up is whether there are any other migrants in the household. The other one is kind of the next up is age and age squared. This is all kind of what we knew uh, from the literature. So what about the weather indicators? The predictive power of weather indicators is actually low relative to individual level indicators, which is not really surprising. But among the nearly 200 indicators that we tried, a couple of them consistently outperform other weather measures. Now, these include really generic and simple measures, like the one I'm sh showing in an orange um, you know, rectangle here, the warmest night, the temperature of the warmest night. So basically, one day's temperature in a year can predict, um, can help predict uh, who the migrants are. Another generic measure is the maximum temperature computed in deviation form from the norm, from the year 1980 to 1984. Another measure is coldest day, the temperature on the coldest day. There are also customized measure that, measures that perform really well, like growing degree days. So this measure actually captures days with optimal temperature for corn, which is the most important crop in Mexico during its growing season. Now, one kind of unexpected insight from here is that the predictive power of weather indicators is small relative to that of US policy, like um, Mexico-US trade measure in blue rectangle here. So basically what happened was by signing NAFTA in 1994, Mexico opened its doors to US corn imports. So many argue that this disrupted a smallholder farming of corn in Mexico, and I'll come to that later. But you know, just to summarize, this exercise allowed us to see what weather indicators matter, and the growing, the importance of growing degree days actually tells us that weather effects on migration likely work through agriculture. So this is an idea that we explore next. Now, the first option that we use to choose the weather measures was this data-driven choice. We're just gonna let the data tell us which ones are the most predictive measures. We're gonna be agnostic about what measures might matter, what time lags might be important. We're not gonna specify, we're gonna learn from data. The second approach is quite different and actually is what we normally do in sociology most of the time, where we think about particular mechanisms through which weather might impact migration and test for these particular things. So here, we're considering the weather sensitivity of important crops like corn. 
And there are different ways of thinking about weather sensitivity, and it's very regionally specific. And rain planting in Mexico of corn happens typically from April to August. Irrigated land planting is from November to February. And this is how the Mexican agricultural census is thinking about the corn seasons. But there's region specific corn calendars. In most regions of Mexico, full corn cycle goes from May to December. But in the South, like Yucatan, which is kind of where the yellow circle is, the season actually runs from June to February. In Northern and Western states, it runs from September to March. So basically we use this very specific customized regional information to create specific measures for different communities. And, um, and to do that in the previous analysis, we included all the communities, rural and urban in our model. Here, because we're testing for particular mechanisms, we're just focusing on agrarian rural communities. And the way we kind of decide that is if about half of the male population or higher is working on agriculture, you are in our, uh, in our data. This gives us 93 communities out of 170. Now we treat the 1980 to 1990 period as the normal period. And then we compute the weather indicators as deviations from the community normal. So basically we take the community weather in any given year, we subtract from it the average weather in the normal period, 1980 to 1990, and then divide the difference by the standard deviation in the same uh, normal period. And we then create five weather categories for rainfall and temperature. So very wet means that your community received two standard deviations or higher rainfall than uh, its average in the normal period. Wet means that it's between one and two standard deviations and dry and very dry are just symmetrical. And that way we're focusing on not just unfavorable weather, but potentially favorable weather as well, like getting more rain than normal, but not excessive. So the outcome is whether someone takes a first migration trip sometime between 1990 and 2018, and we write a model, this time a simple model, not a complex uh, intractable model, like in the random forest case, uh, where the odds of first migration is a function of weather deviations in the past two years, and other inputs. And we treat this as a linear probability model. In other words, we don't use a nonlinear transformation of the outcome, like a logit function. And this actually allows us to better control for state by year fixed effects. Now, this is a bit in the weeds, but the, these kind of state by year fixed effects observe, uh, absorb all observable and unobservable state specific temporal variation. What does it mean? So if the state of Sonora in Mexico experienced a trade shock after NAFTA, for example, like it did, uh, that shock is actually accounted for by the fixed effect. So this means that the effects we're estimating are capturing between community variation in a given state and year. So here's what we find. Extreme decline in rainfall increases the odds of US migration. So when there's a rainfall deficit, droughts, this means US migration is higher. We find that the effect is a lot larger if we're looking at rainfall deficits during the corn growing season. So rather than just annual variation, the more we focus on seasonality of corn, the higher the impact that we can detect in our data. And we also find that the effect is um, larger in communities that are heavily invested in corn. So the more you're dependent on agriculture, production of corn, the more of a migration response you show after a weather shock. And these are some of the kind of coefficient estimates here. And I'm showing estimates for all rural communities versus corn growing communities. And you see the impacts are higher, but we also see that rainfall matters only in the very extreme. So very dry, remember means that rainfall was less than two standard deviations of the average. So really, really low rainfall to observe the impact. We also find that extreme heat doesn't really matter. Now, I talked about temporal dynamics. So we tested for that. And we find that the drought effect actually intensifies over time. So the y-axis here is showing the marginal effects of different weather conditions. And the x-axis is showing combinations of weather over the past two years, T minus one and T minus two. So if you look at um, the leftmost uh, dot, you see that that corresponds to dry weather two years ago, followed by normal and wet weather last year. 
So um, we see that two consecutive years of low rainfall, so dry uh, followed by very dry, actually creates a large impact. So we can detect intensification of effects. And this also suggests that if we were to intervene after a single year of impact, then maybe we would have um, curved uh, migration in this instance. We also find irrigation really mattering. The intensification effects, uh, the effect of these consecutive events are largest in communities with little irrigation. And these are the, core, the marginal effects shown with the empty circles here. So you see this huge jump, whereas the full circles are showing more irrigated communities. So again, a very straightforward uh, policy insight here that if you irrigate, if you intervene after a single year, you might be able to mitigate some of these negative impacts. Of course, the cumulative effects vary by household wealth as well. So here the solid circles are showing the weather effects, the marginal effects for wealthier households, which in this context means owning any assets like a business, land, or a house. And the empty circles are poor households with zero assets. And we see that rich households can actually respond immediately after adverse conditions. So here the orange circle shows a small positive effect for wealthy ass, uh, households experiencing one year of dry weather. So as soon as that happens, there's a migration response. For poor households, it takes more. Poor migrate actually experiencing consecutive years of adversity and rich also respond at the same uh, 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 to this weather, weather com combination, but basically it takes more of an adversity to mobilize the poor. And this might have to do with kind of credit constraints. You really need to be desperate in order to uh, take a, a trip like that. Okay, so basically what we learned from this is weather effects are both cumulative, intensifying over time, and they're heterogeneous. And um, you know, in the literature, climate change literature, people nowadays refer to these as compounding events or socioeconomic status, uh, or kind of a weather condition compounds each other or consecutive weather events compound each other. You know, this is uh, kind of a relatively new terminology for me. Okay. Okay, so basically we focused on selecting weather indicators so far. First, I kind of talked about a data-driven approach. Then I talked about mechanism specific choice and uh, what if there are other things that matter to people that we're not even considering? So right before the pandemic, we actually did field work in Mexico, 2019, and we talked to corn and coffee farmers um, there, and we tried to get a sense of what is most important to them. And we learned many things, but one thing turned out to be really important. Um, one farmer talked about combination of rainfall and temperature being uh, detrimental. So um, he or she's telling us, now it rains, and when it rains, it gets hot. It, it used to not get hot. So basically what we infer from this is like temperature and rainfall are interacting in, um, in different ways to create an impact. And this farmer was absolutely right. When we tested this, we actually find that drought, when it's combined with extreme heat, creates a larger response than any of these conditions alone. Now, we're currently working on a couple couple of extensions and I'll be done in like five minutes or so. So the first question that we ask as an extension is, does extreme weather affect where migrants cross from on the border? Does it make migrants take risks or does having favorable weather allow migrants to avoid such risks of undocumented crossing? Now, for the first part of this project, um, Nancy Chow, who's an uh, economic theorist and uh, you know microeconomist, uh, there kind of she wrote a simple theoretical model of a migrant's choice between multiple crossing locations or as sectors, um, as Border Patrol calls them. So there are nine sectors, um, and each is distinctive in terms of the likelihood of successful crossing, the likelihood of death while try trying to cross, or the cost of crossing, meaning the smuggling fees. So as a shorthand, we can say that the sectors that are easier to cross, that are less guarded, also tend to be deadlier. And numbers tell part of the story. So there are three most popular sectors, and we can see that Tucson is where the probability of crossing is the highest 
it takes on average 1.1 trials according to the data. But the death rate is also the highest here. It's easier to cross, but it's deadlier. So um, we see that nearly three out of 10,000 migrants die trying to cross from the sector. And the deaths are mostly uh, due to dehydration and hypothermia. Smuggling fees are also are tracking these dangers. Smugg smuggling fees are higher in more dangerous spots like Tucson. Again, this is an information that's available in the Mexican Migration Project. So basically, how do migrants make the choice of which sector to cross from? And how does weather uh, factor into these choices? Now, the main premise of our model is that credit constraints matter. So not everyone can afford to pay smuggling fee fees that would help them navigate these more dangerous spots like Tucson. So we think that any factor that creates migration pressures and any factor that affects credit constraints, how much money households have to spend on migration, these will have an impact on where migrants choose to cross from. Now, we consider two such factors that affect both kind of credit constraints and migration pressures. These are community-specific trade shocks and extreme weather shocks. Border enforcement we know also matters. There are sector specific operations that usually target all forces to one location. And uh, we also kind of want to take into account um, uh, those. So it's straightforward to measure weather shocks. I've talked about that already. It's also get easy to get the numbers on border enforcement and these sector specific operations. Now, the big question is how do we measure community specific trade shocks? And this measure I've learned from Nancy it comes from the economics literature, macroeconomics, and economists routinely use this. Um, and it's called import penetration index. So we're measuring this at the municipality level. Municipalities are larger than communities, but that's the level of granularity for which we have data. So basically, um, we measure it at the municipality level in each time period. And we measure this for the agriculture sector specifically, because we're looking at rural agrarian communities. Now, the first term on this index is the ratio of the share of labor force, the share of the labor force in agriculture in that municipality at that time. So what percentage of people in that municipality are working in agriculture relative to the same share in the country? Let's say that in Mexico, 30% of the labor force in agriculture, and then in your community is 90%. So the ratio is three. Now we multiply this or weight this with um, the value of imports in agriculture in the country relative to the country's GDP. So basically after NAFTA, we saw a huge jump in this number. So value of imports in agriculture relative to the GDP increased in Mexico. And the main intuition there is we're trying to capture this trend, but we're also trying to imagine a different impact per community. We're saying that the more a community is invested in agriculture, in its labor force, the more these trends will impact that community. So this is kind of what the import penetration index is. So this is our main measure. And what do we find? Again, our three shocks are border enforcement, import penetration due to trade, and rainfall. Now let's start from the middle row. So the sector-specific border patrol operations, like Operation Gatekeeper in San Diego, divert people from that sector. So the negative the minus there says that people become less likely to cross through that sector, all else equal. Now let's look at the first row, experiencing a negative trade shock, uh, increasing import penetration in agriculture, decreases the chances that someone will select a Tucson sector. Again, this is kind of the expensive sector with, uh, with smugglers. And so the trade shock here reduces your income and your ability to afford smugglers. That's at least kind of how we're interpreting it. Experiencing a positive rainfall shock, so getting more rain than average, which we see on the lowest row, increases the chances that you're going to choose Tucson. So here, uh, our kind of working hypothesis is that basically having good rain increases the crops or the crop growth, and then gives you a little bit of more money and makes you able to afford migration. Now, this is actually an interesting pattern if it's if it's indeed the case, 
until now, I presented weather as a potential constraint, something that is creating problems uh, or obstacles for people for which migration offers a solution. But weather can also be a resource. When it's favorable, it allows people to save and potentially then use that money to migrate. Okay, before I finish, one last result, but I think this is actually the most exciting result personally, until we thought about how weather impacts the decision to migrate. And many of our findings actually did not set the world on fire, but I think we just estimated everything a lot more cleanly and robustly, given kind of um, our attention to measurement and modeling. But basically what we found was having a weather shock impacts whether you cross the border or not. Here in this kind of latest study, we're looking at whether um, weather shocks impact um, the likelihood of return, how long you stay in the US if you're an undocumented migrant. And uh, without going into detail, we basically find that continuing extreme weather in your community is pushing migrants, undocumented migrants, to stay longer. And we find that this effect remains positive for many, many years, up to six years after the time of entry, meaning that migrants are continuing to watch the conditions in their communities when making decisions to return home. So what are the main takeaways here? First of all, we're thinking about migration as an adaptation strategy to weather shocks here. It's shielding people from uh, the threats to their livelihoods that are posed by weather shocks. But we see that rich households can resort to this strategy a lot faster in the year of impact and more safely because they can afford kind of safer crossing locations relative to the poor. We also see that migration and trade policies on the US side, our border enforcement policy and our trade relations can exacerbate the adverse impacts of climate change. And this is likely true for many developing countries in the world. Now, analytically, some of the takeaways that I want to point out, what we've learned from this, first, the level of aggregation really, really matters. So our results became a lot more stable when we refined our measures to the community level and as we customize them to capture particular mechanisms, like outputs in particular crops grown in a community, right? So kind of the more you, you specific you can be about how you think the weather is impacting, I think the more stable and robust uh, the uh, observed results will be. Second, the sequencing of weather events, what happens over multiple years, as well as combination of different weather events, whether drought comes with extreme heat or not, these also really matter. So considering these kind of interactions is important. And then method-wise, we use both well-specified spec parametric models, like the regression model that I showed, as well as non-parametric complex models. And I think they're both useful in different ways. So the well-specified parametric models allow us to test for particular mechanisms, uh, whereas kind of the parametric approach give us a, gives us a sense of our total predictive capacity, even our best model is predicting 80% of the cases, right? And these models also can help us select the most predictive features when we don't have an a priori expectation on how, what weather measures should work. And also we use formal modeling with Nancy's kind of theoretical uh, model, and this allowed us to deduce patterns that we would not have able otherwise have considered. So um, yeah, so this is all I have, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts, questions, any ideas are welcome at this point. Great, thank you very much. Um, I know we have a few, we have a little bit of time for questions. There's a few people who um, ask questions in the chat. So um, uh, we don't have that much time. So if I could ask the, the question posers to please be as concise as possible, um, Tara. Yeah, um, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, really interesting work. Um, I guess two questions. First is just, um, did the weather indicators include anything about pollution or was it just mostly focused on, on rainfall and temperatures? Um, and then, um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip over the methods question just because they're documented in the chat, but I'd actually love to hear more about um, how you considered trade and specifically, um, um, yeah, and I mean, NAFTA had a lot of effects sort of going on and the, the big one I could also think about was sort of like foreign direct um, investments that the United States was then sort of making into Mexico and how you consider that in the migration sort of equation. 
Definitely. No, great questions, Tara. So we didn't consider for pollution, but you know, one thing that bugs me is like, I still can't imagine like how things are working in urban areas. I think with rural communities, we can imagine this kind of agricultural mechanism with urban areas, it's not clear, but we know that extreme heat in urban areas, it can be disruptive. Pollution can be disruptive, but we haven't really looked into that. There is some work emerging from economics looking at that, uh, but we haven't done that um, here. In terms of trade, so foreign direct investments are entering areas where the Macaladoras typically are. Uh, so these kind of um, usually kind of, I've done this not here, but in other work that the regions that receive most infusion of foreign direct investment are not these kind of agricultural areas that we're studying, but more kind of the border area kind of more industrializing places, but it would be interesting actually to look at that. I feel a bit uncomfortable talking about like the NAFTA impact, but now working with economists, they seem perfectly fine with this import penetration index and that capturing uh, trade impact. But, you know, I agree with you. It's really complicated. Great. Thank you. Um, Rob? Um, thanks. It was a very interesting, very nice talk. Um, I've done some work on temperature and historical demography that leads me to uh, really appreciate uh, some of the interactions you looked at, um, for example, with the temperature runs of bad temperature, high temperature, for example. But it looks like you just did um, two year runs. I'm thinking you might try three, three year runs, four year runs. Uh, and then also nonlinearities in the size of the deviation. That is, for example, you can make five variables. One is more than two standard deviations, more than one standard deviation, less than one standard deviation below, and so on. And sometimes interesting things pop up. And um, I also found that sometimes effects of temperature, I uh, didn't have good enough rainfall data to look at that, but they may vary by uh, month of year or season of year so that uh, high may be beneficial in one season and adverse in another season, that sort of thing. Anyway, great talk. Thank you very no, much. No, super reassuring to hear this from you and not Ron. We actually did exactly what you suggested, like the bins based on standard deviations, and that made a big difference because the effects are not continuous. They're kind of, they exist in literally kind of over two standard deviation range, not even kind of like these small deviations. So that was really important. We haven't done like three year runs, even kind of wrapping our heads around two year runs plus temperature and rainfall combinations was kind of overwhelming, but I agree there's a lot of value to that. And in terms of like the timing, I talked to a lot of kind of uh, agronomers in at Cornell before moving to uh, Princeton at Cornell. It was very advantageous to studying this because of, um, you know, uh, they have a college on that. And I tried to get at like, what are the sensitive periods for corn? And the answer I got was typically like, oh, it's more of an art than a science. You never know. So I use these kind of corn calendars to nail down, okay, what about, is it the planting season, the growth season? What happens when we capture these different moments? But, you know, I wish I had a better way of kind of capturing these sensitivities because we do have daily data. We literally have daily data that we're not using. We're just aggregating them into these kind of monthly seasonal measures. But I agree, that's, that's the future. Great, thank you. Um, one more, uh, uh, Claude, I think, messaged me and said he had a question. Yeah, hi, this is a very exciting data and congratulations on the project. I have a sort of fundamental question, which is what's the proper unit of analysis? Uh, I, I think you, you have huge variation among individuals and that clearly shapes a lot of the modeling problems. Uh, there's also, I think, another problem, potential problem with using the individual as unit analysis is that migration decisions are family decisions. So you might send the youngest son, uh, even though it's the oldest son's family that's being affected by the agriculture. So my thought was, okay, so I think there's a problem with in, using individuals as unit of analysis, but also the question seems to be one that's an aggregate question. It's about policy. Yeah. It's about the flow of migrants to the United States. And so it seems to me an alternative thing would be to have the units of analysis be either communities 
or regions or more radically year by season. And, and then it seems to me, you would see the weather effects on aggregated phenomenon. You would also see the trade shocks on aggregated phenomena. So that's, that's my question is really, uh, you know, do we want the individual to be the unit of analysis here? Even though Absolutely. it's great data, it's great data at the individual level, but it's, is it the right one? Absolutely. I think as sociologists, like individual level data, individuals role within households, like the question, the way you phrase it is always interesting to me. Like my book was all about like who in the family migrates under different conditions. Is it the younger sons? Younger sons are indeed mobilized at times of crisis. Uh, whereas in normal economic times, it's the household head that migrates. So I think those dynamics you can capture with individual level data. But I agree with you, especially when you're using machine learning methods, when you have a community level measure, the best you can predict is the community mean. It's You're not gonna predict better than that with that level of granularity. And for policy decisions, maybe we wanna understand where migrants are emerging from, whether those communities have irrigation or not. What can we do in those communities to maybe kind of mitigate the need to migrate? I agree with you. Then the right level of analysis is actually community. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, we're running a little bit over, but I think there was one more question maybe from Jenna. Did I see that right? Yeah, I don't want to suck up any time. Um, it, well, Philly is really, this is this is great. You're <laughs> so happy to see you. <laughs> it's so nice to see you too. You're tackling a huge range of things. And so I guess my question is, you've got this machine learning uh, mechanism really ramped up here. And I was thinking more about Ron's question and the process by which local areas become less hospitable to the production of, of corn and coffee over time. And as one fa farm falls and the cooperatives begin to collapse, how lucrative it is for everyone else, it, there's just a gradual undermining of this as a, a livelihood. And I was thinking about the fact that one of the reasons that's really hard to model is because it has so many dimensions. And to the extent that you could mobilize the machine learning tools here in, in a classification algorithm to think about the prediction of the, the undermining of uh, environmental capacity to support agrarian livelihood might be a, a way to use these same types of tools uh, from a modeling standpoint. Definitely, definitely. Like two very quick points. So yes, so we actually, um, I, there are a number of postdocs who do this kind of for in the environmental sciences, and we just kind of did an analysis inspired by their ideas using this data. And this idea of spatial compounding that you're describing, like one community suffers, the other doesn't from the weather, but then they're kind of aftershocks because this community is now migrating to those places and just pushing them out. There's definitely evidence of that. Like within the same state, one community's misery becomes everyone else's misery over time. So, you know, I need to think about like how to model that with a machine learning. In terms of the machine learning front, I'm also kind of working with two computer science students who found a much better way of defining the question. And so I kind of define it as, do you migrate in this year or not? But they thought that's not the right question, similar to kind of what Claude was asking. We want to know, like, will you migrate in the next five years? Will you migrate in the next 10 years? And when you kind of expand the question like that, you can actually, your prediction levels go up to like 92%, 93%. So maybe from a policy perspective, that's something important to say as well. If we don't do anything about this in the next five years, this is what we're going to observe. But, you know, thank you so much. Great. Um, so I think we're out of time. Uh, please, everybody, join me in thanking Felice again, Professor Gara, for joining us. And um, I believe that um, the grad, some graduate students, are going to um, continue on the chat to 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 discuss some more. Um, so thank you, everyone else, for coming, and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next week. Well, thank you to everyone for your generous comments, for having me. Lovely to see everyone on the screen. Next time in person, I hope. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.